Hello everyone. Welcome to the Centre for Eye Research Australia's event, Keratoconus in 2020, an update on research and treatment. My name is Professor Mark Daniel and I'm an ophthalmic surgeon, um, head of corneal um, service at the Eye and Ear Hospital and also lead Sierra's corneal research unit. I know many of you would um, be looking forward to meeting our researchers in person, but unfortunately that's not possible this year. Um, it, so we've uh, embraced a digital uh, capacity, which has many advantages. Firstly, um, this webinar format means that you'll, the uh, talks will all be recorded and you'll be able to watch them again afterwards. Um, it also means that as well as our local experts, we've been able to get um, Professor Janji, uh, who trained with us um, originally, but now works in Pittsburgh, uh, USA. Uh, before we begin, can I remind you that um, we're really looking forward to hearing your questions. Um, you can ask the questions by uh, typing in the question box. Um, you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, obviously, we can't give you um, management or medical advice, but um, we can usually answer your questions quite, um, you know, in a way that you might be able to um, get something useful. Um, for, the, for those of you who haven't um, come to a Centre of Eye Research uh, meeting before, I thought it'd be good to recap exactly who we are and what we do. At Sierra, our mission is to eliminate the major eye diseases that cause vision loss and blindness and to reduce their impact on people's lives. We have strong collaborations with the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital and the University of Melbourne, and that helps us to create strong and innovative culture where we can actively support the commercialization of promising research findings to accelerate the translation of new treatments and technologies from the laboratory to the bedside. As for our Keratoconus Research Unit, we've been looking at new treatments, um, new and improved diagnostic tests, evaluating and improving on surgery, as well as looking into the fundamental basis um, of disease. So this evening, um, we've come together to provide information about um, keratoconus. This fits in nicely with uh, tomorrow being World Keratoconus Day, a day dedicated to raising awareness about the eye condition, as well as educating and advocating for those living with keratoconus. Philanthropic support is critical to the keratoconus research we undertake at the Centre for Eye Research Australia. We simply couldn't advance our research in this field without having many generous supporters. Um, many of you who are, who are tuned in today to the webinar. I think so far we've got well over 50 people tuned in and they're expecting um, somewhere near 300. Thank you for your continued generosity. For those of you who are considering making a donation in support of our research, you can do that by visiting our website. Today I'm joined by Dr. Srijana Sabjada and Associate Professor Elaine Chong from the Centre of Eye Research Australia, as well as Professor Paul Baird from the University of Melbourne, Professor Vishal Janshi from the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, Dr. Elsie Chan from the Eye and Ear Hospital to discuss keratoconus and the latest research and treatment updates. So the first of our presentations today, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Srijana Sabjada. Sur Srijana has been working with us for many years. She did her PhD in our department and is now um, has been a postdoc for many years as a clinician scientist with a strong research interest in corneal disease, vision restoration, and the assessment of visual performance. She's also a senior research fellow at the University of Melbourne. Over to you, Srijana. Good evening, everyone. On the occasion of World Keratoconus Day, it's a great pleasure for me to talk to you all about keratoconus and the research that we are conducting at the Centre for Research Australia. I think it will be useful to start this session by talking about what exactly keratoconus is, so as to raise the awareness about the condition in the general audience, as well as it gives an understanding of the research that we are conducting. As some of you know, the cornea is the front transparent window of the eye that allows transmission of light to the back of the eye so we can see clearly. The normal shape of the cornea is spherical, but in keratoconus, it becomes conical because of the abnormal steepening and thinning and thus affects vision. Keratoconus is bilateral 
and progressive in most cases, meaning it affects both the eyes and the signs and symptoms worsen over time. And these include blurred and double vision, glare, distortion, and poor night vision. The reported prevalence rates of keratoconus are drastically increasing from 1 in 2000 in 1986 to 1 in 375 in 2016. That is almost a five-fold increase over the past two decades. Also, keratoconus is one of the top indications for corneal transplantation globally. And in Australia itself, it accounts for 30% of corneal transplantation. Unlike other common eye conditions, the onset of keratoconus is usually in early teens to early adulthood. There are increasing reports of keratoconus occurring in children as well. Pedi pediatric keratoconus appears to be more rapidly progressive and higher rates of treatment failures compared to adult keratoconus. Keratoconus management. Elaine will be talking later about this in detail, but briefly, in the early stages, vision is correctable to a large extent with glasses. With the progression of the condition, contact lenses are required. In few patients, the central cornea becomes severely thin and irregular, and corneal transplantation is required to restore vision. Other forms of surgical treatments include various forms of lamellar keratoplasty and intracorneal rings. All of these techniques correct the refractive error of keratoconus, but do not treat the underlying weakness of the cornea and thinning, and thus do not stop the progression of the condition. Collagen corneal crosslinking is the new treatment option for keratoconus, wherein the cornea is stiffened by the application of ultraviolet light and riboflavin drops. Although it has shown to slow the progression of keratoconus, the procedure is only suitable for earlier stages of the condition. Now, why do we need to conduct research about keratoconus? Despite the increasing prevalence of the condition, there are still unanswered questions related to the condition. These include, what exactly causes the condition? Is it the genes or the environment? While both genetics and environment factors appear to be involved, our current understanding of their influence is limited. Next, are there any out-of-pocket costs incurred by the patients to get the test done and undergo the treatment? Does the condition have an, any impact on the quality of life of these patients? And clinically, as I mentioned earlier, collagen cross-linking that slows the progression of keratoconus can only be uh, applied for the early stages of the condition. But detecting these early stages is clinically diffi difficult because at the incipient stages, also known as subclinical, keratoconus does not produce any symptoms and thus can go unnoticed both by the patient and the clinician unless specific diagnostic tests such as corneal topography are performed. So to address these issues, we are conducting the Australian study of keratoconus, also known as ASK which is a well-characterized study with the main aims of identifying the risk factors for keratoconus, early detection of keratoconus, and improving the current management strategies. Now, what's involved in the study? The recruitment and data collection of keratoconus subjects can be divided into a four-phase process. Stage one, each participant will receive an information statement and complete the consent form. Second stage is completing the questionnaires. These questionnaires can be emailed as online surveys and are collected using a secure online database known as REDCap. Alternatively, the questionnaires can also be posted to the subjects. Then a comprehensive eye examination will be undertaken at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. And finally, 
a blood or saliva sample will be collected for genetic analysis. Now, the patients have the option to consent and participate only in a part of the study. That is, say for example, someone is interested in only filling out the online surveys and does not want to undergo the eye testing or donate bloods. Then that can be done as well. Results. So far, we have recruited over 400 subjects and the age range of the subjects is between 11 to 78 years with the mean age of 36 years. The largest proportion of the subjects were between 18 to 35 years, followed by those in 36 to 53 years. Majority of the subjects were Europeans, followed by those in the Asian group. Genetic results can be reported in two approaches. We identified a few candidate genes associated with keratoconus in the samples that we collected from the subjects who participated in the ASKED study. And these include the hepatocyte growth factor gene, corneal thickness genes, and the genes related to age-related macular degeneration. A further collaborative genome-wide association study was undertaken by pulling our samples with international groups to identify significant locus for keratoconus. With regards to the risk factors, we assessed a wide range of all currently known environmental risk factors in a large group of subjects that we recruited through ASK and found that asthma had a significant association with the severity of keratoconus. Having noticed considerable changes in various clinical measurements of keratoconus, we assessed the impact of the condition on vision-related quality of life of the subjects. The study demonstrated that worse vision in the better eye was associated with the reduction in vision and quality of life of the subjects. The results also showed that the quality of life of the keratoconus patients was significantly lower than the patients with later onset eye diseases, such as age-related macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. Another important finding for, from the patient's perspective is the study on economic impact of the condition, where we found that the total cost related to the direct and indirect care of the condition was estimated to be around $3,365 per year for each subject. Now, this was almost 30 folds more than what the general population pays for, the care, for their care of the eyes. Clinically, we identified some important corneal parameters related to corneal thickness at different locations that will assist with the early detection of subclinical keratoconus. And for the first time, we have identified certain changes in the back portion of the eye known as retina, in addition to the corneal changes in the keratoconus subjects. Now, that would have been a bit too technical for some of you. So to summarize these in simple terms, keratoconus appears to be heterogeneous, meaning it is caused by both genetics and environmental factors. And keratoconus has a significant impact on the quality of life of the subjects and treatment and rehabilitation of the better eye would be more efficient, efficient to improve the quality of life of these subjects. Further, our results from the costs associated with the diagnosis and management of keratoconus represents a significant cost to the patients. In addition to this, as keratoconus affects individuals from a young age, the study highlights keratoconus as a significant public health concern. Finally, our results using Pentacam, which is the advanced imaging technique, has identified a few important markers for early detection of the condition. Now, what's next? The availability of these preliminary data allows us to target a few specific areas for further research. So, the projects that we are currently conducting 
are the gene expression analysis of keratoconus corneas. The genetic studies that we have undertaken so far were using the blood or saliva samples from the keratoconus subjects. Now, we, we are extending this to the localized corneal tissues that can be collected during corneal transplantation. As can be seen from the picture, the deceased tissue is typically discarded post corneal transplantation. We would like to collect this tissue from keratoconus and non-keratoconus subjects and undertake high throughput next generation genetic analysis to identify the exact genes and the genetic pathways that is involved in the disease. Next, to clearly explore the association of irobin with keratoconus, we are conducting a study to evaluate the pattern of irobin in keratoconus subjects. This will be conducted with the short self-administered questionnaire that will take up approximately five to 10 minutes per person to complete. And the data will be collected and stored again using a secure online database. The results will help us understand if the pattern of eye rubbing is linked to the progression of the condition or the severity of the condition and determine the cause effect relationship. Advanced corneal imaging techniques. Now, advanced corneal imaging systems generate a large amount of data and images that are too numerous to analyze manually. This problem can be solved by the application of artificial intelligence that can mimic human behavior and intelligence. Artificial intelligence studies have been applied in ophthalmology and, and have been focused to the back of the eye, that is the retina, such as diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration, but very few studies have been applied in the front of the eye and more, much, much fewer to the keratoconus. So our aim is to apply artificial intelligence to address the clinical gaps in detecting subclinical keratoconus, staging of keratoconus severity, and predict the keratoconus progression. Finally, we have recently established the Keratoconus International Consortium, KIC as we call it, Professor Vishal Janji will be talking more about the importance of this international collaboration. But if I were to talk uh, or say about the international consortium in one point, there are various grading systems and classification systems described in literature, but there is no consistent and a global standard method to correlate with the disease impact that would assist in a better management strategy. So the main aim of this consortium is to produce a more streamlined and a concrete effort to better understand the condition and ultimately, and ultimately cure the condition. This is the current map of the consortium, which shows over 40 national and international members who have come forward to better understand the condition and work towards uh, understanding the risk factors, early detection, uh, globalized uh, classification system, and finally, ways to avoid the need for corneal transplantation. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the current participants who have helped us achieve the results that I have just shown, and also would like to call forward the volunteers with keratoconus to participate for future studies and those who are undergoing corneal transplantation to donate their corneal buttons for uh, our research. I've listed the email address and you will find more information about our study and further details on the SERA website. I would also like to acknowledge our team members and the INDR hospital medpic and clinical information team that have helped us uh, get to the current stage with our results. Last but not the least, the funding sources, the government as well as the philanthropic funding sources. Most importantly, uh, I would like to acknowledge the philanthropic support that we have received from the Perpetual Impact 
philanthropic grants, lion's eye donation, care to Konos Australia, and your and Wills. With, without their support, we wouldn't be able to conduct so many studies and uh, uh, do the research that we have been wanting to do. Special thanks to Keratoconus Australia, the president Larry Kornhoscher for sending out the uh, invitation to all the members. Uh, and I'm sure there are many members in the audience who are uh, viewing this uh, webinar today. Thank you, Vanenod. That was great, Shoshana. Thanks so much for that presentation. I'd now like to introduce uh, to you um, Associate Professor Elaine Chong. Elaine is the Head of Ophthalmology at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and is a consultant ophthalmologist, both of the corneal unit and the retinal unit at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. She has a keen interest in new surgical techniques and has been developing several new treatments for um, both keratoconus and other corneal diseases. Over to you. Hi, I'm Elaine Chong, and I'm here to talk about keratoconus in 2020. Talking a little bit about um, the, a little bit of introduction about keratoconus, but focusing mainly on the diagnosis and treatments in keratoconus. So keratoconus affects the cornea, which is this part of the eye. As you can see, it has a protrusion in the cornea, which is the front part of the eye. And that is important as the cornea focuses the light rays into the retina and the back of the eye, just like, a, just like a lens. So in the healthy person, the cornea is round and so the light actually focuses on a single point. Whereas in a keratoconic eye where the cornea looks more like a cone, the light rays don't focus well and that's why the visual acuity or the vision is not good with keratoconus. So in keratoconus, the cornea actually thins out and also bulges forwards like a cone. Um, so usually it's cone and sagging downwards, which is why it looks, we sometimes call it a nipple cone. There's also quite a few layers in the cornea and all of them are um, stretched out. So why do hard contact lenses improve my vision? Well, hard contact lenses, as you can see here, is rigid and they are placed directly onto the cornea, which then regularizes the keratoconic cornea into a more regular round shape. That's why it improves the vision. So how do we diagnose keratoconus? Um, keratoconus is diagnosed when your vision changes with time. And quite often what happens is that the glasses requirements, especially the astigmatism increases with time. Another very important way of monitoring keratoconus is to look at the scans of the, of the cornea uh, called the pentacam scans. And you can see here these colorful scans actually looks at about 140,000 points on the cornea. So it's a high, highly um, accurate scan of the cornea. And with time, if we do one scan now and one scan six months later and so on and so forth, we can monitor with time to see whether it actually stays stable or it, is it getting worse and getting steeper and thinner. So we track changes over time. This records the speed of progression of keratoconus. There's also clinical signs that we look for, but often with clinical signs, it will be advanced disease. So we are really trying to figure out when somebody has keratoconus early because now we, we have treatment for uh, slowing down or stabilizing keratoconus. So I have keratoconus, so what do I do now? The most important thing is do not rub your eyes. Okay, rubbing your eyes will increase the progression of keratoconus. It will also, um, it can also cause a complication when you rub your eyes really hard that splits the innermost layer of the cornea called the decimase and you get this whitish uh, lesion on the cornea right smack in the middle of your vision. And so you can't see very well. So that's called cornea hydrops, which is a complication of keratoconus. So use your ocular lubricants like Sustain or Sally Fresh when you need that when you feel like you need to rub them and you need to be monitored, that's very important because we wanna catch the disease if we think it's progressing. So the treatments for keratoconus include cornea collagen cross-linking uh, and also intrastromal cornea rings as well as cornea transplantation where there is partial thickness um, cornea transplants such as deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, which we call DOLC or uh, full thickness cornea transplants called penetrating keratoplasties, which I'll discuss in a few moments. So I have keratoconus, should I have cross-linking? So when do you do cross-linking? 
Cross-linking is done when we show that there's progressive keratoconus with worsening visual acuity or the pentacam scans that uh, we track over time is progressing, okay? We don't really need to uh, cross-link everybody who's keratoconic, but only those people who are progressing. So that's why you need to be monitored. What cross-linking does is to stabilize the cornea. It's not a cure for keratoconus. And data is limited as it's only been around for, for about 10 years. So some, when, when in medicine, something 10, around 10 years or a decade old is still something new. So we're still collecting a lot of information on uh, what happens after, after 10, 15 years. There's also many different protocols, but what you need to understand with cross-linking is that uh, the main side effect is after cross-linking, it's a discomfort and pain in the eye for about three to four days, uh, mainly because we usually, in Melbourne at least, we usually remove the epithelium, which is the top part of the cornea, so that the um, riboflavin, which is a vitamin, can soak into the cornea, and then the light, which is a UVA light, causes covalent bonds to form. So before cross-linking and after cross-linking, it causes covalent bonds, the red bonds to form to strengthen the cornea, stops it from uh, thinning out and protruding. So even after cross-linking, you cannot rub your eyes, okay? Your finger is still stronger than the cross-linking and you still need to be monitored. So is cross-linking scary? Well, this is pretty much a video of cross-linking. It is quite um, uh, a slow process where you just basically stare at a light source for about 30 minutes or so. Um, so it is not really scary. Um, you know, 13 year old boys can tolerate that during the procedure, there's no pain at all, okay? Um, is there a limit to when we can, is there like a, when is too late to cross-link? So there is a certain cutoff of the cornea thickness. So if the cornea is way too thin, then cross-linking is not safe. But the uh, thickness of that has been changing a little bit. Um, and I would say around now it's about 380 microns before we say if it's less than 380 microns, we may consider, uh, we have to talk about whether we can cross-link or not. How about intrastromial cornea rings? So these are PMMA um, ring segments, which are basically like a plastic or acrylic segment that is a foreign body inserted into the cornea at about 80% depth into the cornea. Uh, what it does is to then reshape the cornea a little bit but, and it's usually combined with cross-linking, um, but you still need contact lenses or glasses after that, and it's not covered by Medicare. And even then, you still cannot rub your eyes after intrastromal ring segments. Um, there are risks associated with the intrastromal cornea rings, which include infection, ex extrusion of the foreign body, which means that basically it migrates up and comes out through the cornea, it can cause cornea melts, which means this, the tissue above the ring segment just disappears. Uh, and the lens segment can actually migrate and move. So there's quite a few risks, risks involved. And I'm not a huge advocate for intracornea ring segments of this material at this, at this time point. Um, but there are new technology coming out, new studies coming out, where, um, which I'll discuss later, where uh, cornea segments are actually inserted instead of a foreign body ring segment. How about cornea transplant? When should I have a cornea transplant? Generally speaking, we try to avoid a cornea. We try to avoid doing cornea transplants. We want to capture the keratoconus early so that we can cross-link and stabilize the cornea. Uh, we decide to perform a cornea transplant usually in cases where the cornea is super, super thin and super steep such that the contact lens don't even sit well, you can't even tolerate a contact lens, or in cases of cornea hydrox where the cornea is completely white at the front, and so you don't have a choice but to remove the cornea and take somebody else's cornea who has donated their corneas and put it into your eyes and sew it down with stitches, as you can see here. Okay, so that's full thickness cornea graft where the entire cornea is somebody else's that is inserted into your cornea, or a partial thickness called a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, um, inserted there, but you can see here, it really depends on how much uh, of your own stroma, this part of the eye is left behind. Ideally, what we wanna do is to leave only the decimates, which we call this a pre-decimatic dog, uh, so that the visual acuity or the vision after the cornea transplant is improved. So because we're changing the entire cornea, it completely changes the shape of the cornea 
and um, the vision improves. However, you still need glasses or contact lenses, although probably not as strong as if you didn't have the cornea transplant. And you still cannot rub your eyes and, needs, and you need to be monitored. So are there anything else possible? What are the other treatment uh, options on a horizon? So like I mentioned before, uh, the cornea allogenic intrastromous ring segments, essentially what this means is that instead of the PMMA acrylic segments, we uh, get some cornea tissue that's donated, cut it into a ring segment fashion and insert it uh, mid stroma, about 50% into the cornea. This is still being developed and it is quite promising, uh, but this is not mainstream at the moment. The other um, more um, experimental treatment is Bowman's layer transplant. So this is the Bowman's layer over here, which is a superficial, slightly thicker layer where only this layer is then transplanted mid stroma. The surgery is a bit more challenging and is again, not mainstream, but these are a few things that we should look out for. But a common theme here is that you do not rub your eyes, okay? And you, you still need glasses and contact lenses even, um, even after all the treatments. Whether you have treatment or not, you do not rub your eyes. So this is just a video on why you should not rub your eyes. It's a common habitual behavior, but it can be extremely bad for the eyes when it is intense and repetitive, leading to a pathology known as keratoconus. To this day, little was known about what happens to the globe when it is rubbed. So we performed an MRI on a healthy doctor volunteer within our team and asked him to rub his eyes. And the results are striking. The cornea distorts and the globe steps back into the eye socket. Those images illustrate well the trauma that is inflicted to the eye during vigorous rubbing. And it is easy to understand that this behavior can be very harmful if repeated day after day for many years. But if you think keratoconus is the only side effect of this risky behavior, think again. Reports of glaucoma, high fever, lens subluxation, and retinal detachments have been published over the last few years. Don't rub your eyes. So please do not rub your eyes and I hope um, you found this uh, informative. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elaine. That was terrific. I think we've all got the message. Do not rub your eyes. As for our last presentation this evening, let me introduce Professor Vishal Janji. Vishal is a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, He's made a significant contribution to the field of cornea and external eye disease and is presently involved in researching, in research encompassing keratoconus, dry eyes, infectious keratitis and corneal imaging. Vishal trained with us um, many years ago at the Eye Near Hospital, but he, we've been watching his career with uh, great interest. Unfortunately, he's unable to join us live this morning due to the time difference in the US but has pre-recorded a short presentation that we'll show you now. Good evening, everyone. My name is Vishal Janji. I'm a professor in ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. I want to thank the organizers of this program, especially Srijana, for asking me to speak on this topic. In my talk, I'll briefly discuss topics and queries in Keratoconus research. I do not have any financial disclosures relevant to this talk. What is keratoconus? I'm sure this has been discussed a few times today that keratoconus is characterized by central and paracentral corneal thinning. Loss of vision is mainly due to irregular astigmatism. Importantly, although we think that it starts in the second decade of life, there is increasing evidence that keratoconus really begins earlier than that. We continue to see more and more young kids with keratoconus. One of the main challenges is to diagnose keratoconus. And I'm not talking about diagnosing well-established disease. The challenge lies in picking up keratoconus at an early stage, which is relevant now, since you want to cross-link these patients and stabilize the disease. This is a corneal topography image from swept source OCT. It looks very normal. The built-in Ectasia detection software tells us that there's a 0% chance of this cornea being ectatic. 
Shine flag imaging shows a normal D value. However, when you look at the contralateral eye, it is a surprise that the contralateral eye has advanced keratoconus, which further means that the other eye, which we saw earlier, has what we label as form first keratoconus or early keratoconus or keratoconus that has not manifested yet. Consequently, the focus has now changed towards non-tomographic diagnosis of keratoconus with an understanding that functional changes in these eyes, they happen earlier than actual structural changes in the cornea. Researchers have been looking at evaluating corneal biomechanics in early stages of keratoconus with an established notion that corneal weakening sets in motion a series of events that ultimately lead to corneal ectasia. And if we can pick up these changes, we might be able to decrease the severity of structural damage in keratoconus. A platform called Corvus utilizes shine plug imaging to measure the bending of cornea in response to a puff of air. Intuitively, a thinner ectatic cornea will bend more than a normal cornea. Based on data from Corvus, a new indicator called Corvus Biomechanical Index or CBI was developed, which is supposed to pick biomechanical alterations in keratoconus. Well, someone was smart enough to realize that combining CBI with tomographic parameters would be even more sensitive in diagnosing keratoconus. So consequently, another new indicator called Tomographical Biomechanical Index or TBI was described. Let us quickly go back to that scan that I showed earlier from a form fresh keratoconus um, patient with normal corneal scans, at least normal looking corneal scans. Now, if you look here, both CBI and TBI are abnormal for this patient. But needless to say, multiple studies have validated the utility of these two indices in diagnosing early disease or form fresh keratoconus. Let us, quick, let us move on to the next topic, which is management of keratoconus. Now, this algorithm was published in 2011 um, when I had just finished my fellowship in Melbourne and had moved to Hong Kong. And if you look at this, it mostly recommends various techniques of corneal transplantation depending on the severity of disease. Post -fa fast forward to today, the new goals in the management of keratoconus are to halt the disease progression and visually rehabilitate these patients. Collagen cross-linking has emerged as a major winner when it comes to the techniques that tend to halt the disease progression. Earlier and very nicely done studies from Melbourne have shown the safety and efficacy of the technique. I'm sure Dr. Chan has already covered this topic. Well, since we are never happy with simple things in life, we complicated this one as well. Not too long ago, different techniques of cross-linking were proposed, mainly to reduce the time taken to perform the procedure. As they say, faster is better. Some modifications were meant to hasten the recovery, but probably at the expense of reducing the efficacy of the procedure. We want to improve our understanding of cross-linking. We want to know what the best protocol for performing cross-linking is. This is relevant because we've started doing cross-linking in kids now. We want to know if external oxygen supplementation will help to increase the effect of cross-linking or whether we can repeat cross-linking a few years down the line. And this video shows the difference in an ectatic cornea and a normal cornea before and after cross-linking. You will see how an ectatic thin cornea bends more than a normal cornea. Now this video looks exciting, but unfortunately there are no numbers on this. It's still a work in progress. We have more questions. We want to understand the epidemiology of keratoconus. Why is it more prevalent in certain parts of the world? We want to know the science behind genetics of keratoconus. We want to use uh, exciting imaging technologies to diagnose keratoconus. With so many questions, the clear answer is collaboration. The Keratoconus International Consortium 
is a worldwide effort led by the Centre for Eye Research Australia. KIC was established in 2016. The consortium members have combined their efforts to enhance understanding of the disease. Currently, there are 40 corneal research groups around the world from countries like Australia, India, Japan, United States, and China. The goals of KIC include to establish a collective global database from different ethnicities and geographical locations around the world, to build a unified understanding of the causes of keratoconus, to understand risk factors for the occurrence of keratoconus, and to improve diagnosis and treatment of keratoconus. The KIC website is open to all. Please feel free to browse the website and pass on the information to your peers. Please encourage them to join the efforts of KIC. Thank you very much for your attention. It was a uh, great summary and pulled together a lot of the thoughts that um, we, we've been having in the, um, in the keratoconus research field over the past um, few years. Um, that concludes our presentations for this evening. Um, we've been flooded with questions and joining me to help answer uh, some of these questions, we have our presenters, um, Srujana and, um, and Elaine Chong, as well as Professor Paul Baird. Paul has over 25 years experience in the field of genetics and is a senior NHMRC fellow based at the University of Melbourne, works closely with us here at um, CIRA and at the Iron Needle. We also have uh, Elsie Chan. Elsie Chan is a senior consultant in the Cornell Union. She's been deeply involved in keratoconus research for uh, many years and has recently published um, papers on cross-linking and on keratoconus and cataract surgery. Um, so we've got, uh, as I say, we've got quite a few questions and what I'll do is I'll throw to the various um, experts um, and you can keep typing into the, um, into the feed on the bottom. If we've got time, we'll answer as many as we can. So the first question was from Glenda. Glenda asks, um, um, can a corneal graft be operated on to remove a cataract that is formed on the eye, or is there a high risk that the corneal graft will fail? Elsie, that's, uh, that's your special subject. What do you, what do you think? Um, so the question was whether it's okay to perform a cataract surgery when you have a corneal transplant, is that correct? Yes, we, we do know that um, cataracts, everyone develops cataracts as they get older, that's the normal clouding of the lens. And certainly if you've had a corneal transplant, a cataract uh, forms earlier than uh, would otherwise um, be formed. And so um, absolutely to get the best vision, it is worthwhile having cataract surgery. However, the outcomes of cataract surgery in terms of the vision you get isn't going to be the same as someone who hasn't had cataract surgery because you do have to account for the um, distortions of the corneal transplant in how your vision might be afterwards. And also the calculations of the strength of the artificial lens that goes in the eye is complex when you've had a corneal transplant. But it's definitely worthwhile in order for you to get the best possible vision. Thanks, Elsie. Um, Question for Elaine from John. Um, what corneal thickness threshold determines when rigid contact lenses can be ceased and a corneal graft should be uh, performed? Um, it is not so much the thickness of the cornea, it's whether you can tolerate the contact lens or not. So it really depends on uh, how steep your cornea is and whether you can actually fit, the, will the contact lens actually fit well and do you get good vision out of the contact lens? So if, you, the, if the answer is no, the contact lens doesn't fit, no, I don't get good vision, then you're looking at um, a cornea transplantation, which nowadays with different techniques, we can actually do um, the partial thickness cornea transplant, which is the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So the rejection, rejection is a lot lower compared to penetrating keratoplasty, which is the full thickness one. And often after cornea transplantation, your vision will be better and you can fit contact lenses a lot better. Okay, um, thank, thanks, Elaine. Now, an easy question for Paul. Um, is keratoconus hereditary? Thanks for the question. Um, yes, in some people. Um, about 20% of keratoconus is probably hereditary. Um, and we know this because it, it occurs in families, and some of these families are very large. Um, we also know that there are other genetic markers that have been identified that relate to how curved the 
cornea is or how thick the cornea is. Um, and there's also been a number of genetic studies that have actually looked at identifying particular genes. So it, we're beginning to see a arsenal of different genes that are involved in keratoconus. Um, and certainly going forward, we know of some very large studies that, that we're also involved in uh, that will identify a whole bunch more genes uh, in keratoconus. So to answer your question, yes, um, we certainly know in some, if not all, there is a genetic involvement. Um, and how the genes and environment come together is the next challenge that we need to investigate. That's great. Now, for Surjan has got a question from Stephen. Um, why do you think the incidence of keratoconus is increasing in the population? Rishana, you're on mute, I think. Okay, sorry. That's an interesting question. There could be several reasons for it. One, there could be a definite increase in the prevalence of the condition itself because of uh, various uh, factors like aerobing, as Elaine mentioned, and hereditary conditions, as Paul mentioned. Or there could be other reasons, such as improved corneal uh, topographic systems, which are able to detect the condition as well. So it could be a combination of all these because of which the incidence of the condition has increased. Thanks, Rujana. A uh, question for um, Elsie from Kishore. Um, how often do we um, cross-think? So how often can we do cross-thinking in a patient? Um, hi, Kishaw. Thanks for the question. That's an excellent question. We know that in the adult population, cross-linking is effective in slowing down keratoconus in about 95% of all people. And we know that in the vast majority, it'll probably last um, a good five to 10 years. So by and large, for most people, because they're getting uh, cross-linking, say in their 20s or late 20s, if the cross-linking effect were to wear off, um, the person should be old enough anyway where they will stabilise and they don't need further cross-linking. So looking in the limited um, literature, the, there's been very few people who've needed repeat cross-linking when they're older. However, the situation is probably different for um, paediatric or less than 18-year-old age group because we know in that age group there's a much more higher likelihood that the that keratoconus progresses again after a number of years. So I do think that if a young person has cross-linking and their eye stabilizes for a good number of years, say three to five years, and then they start to progress again, then cross-linking is warranted. However, that is a very uncommon situation. On the other hand, there are the odd patient where uh, they have cross-linking and re um, irrespective of the treatment, their keratoconus gets worse anyway. In those patients, there's not a lot of evidence and having cross-linking straight away a second time will necessarily be more effective than the first time. Thank you. We've got a few questions on cross-linking. Maybe um, Elaine can tackle this one. Um, I had cross-linking for my left eye and it became infected. What is the likelihood of happening in the right eye when that gets cross-linked? Um, it really depends on why you had the infection in the first place. Um, is it because, you know, you've had pre-existing eyelid issues or did the contact lens fall out and it was placed back in? But having said that, um, there needs to be a lot more care with cross-linking in your other eye next time around. So we'll be looking after the post-surgery post um, issues with a lot more detail and probably follow you up very closely. So I think you could say it's very, very unlikely to get an infection the second time. Lightning doesn't strike twice. Um, look, another question on cross-linking from Diana. Um, Elsie, do you want to try this one now? When should we refer for cross-linking? Hi, Diana. Um, referral for cross-linking really depends on whether we've established that the, the keratoconus, is, keratoconus is getting worse. So if we have evidence that the keratoconus is definitely getting worse based on the vision or based on your glasses prescription or scans such as what Elaine and Michelle showed, then you should refer straight away. Um, if you're not sure, it's always safer to refer earlier rather than later because we don't want to miss the opportunity of offering cross-linking while the vision's still pretty good and waiting too long when the vision's already gone bad um, because cross-linking um, doesn't actually bring back vision that's already been lost. It just stabilises it where it is. 
Yeah, that's right. I think that uh, apart from progressive keratoconus, you want to refer uh, patients who are young, um, especially if it's mild in, in a young person. Um, we really don't probably need to see the, uh, the stable disease, the patients who've had it for many decades, who've been happy in their glasses or contact lenses for a long time. So the, the next question on um, cost thinking is from Catherine. Maybe Elaine, do you want to try this one? Um, is there an age limit for people to be treated with cross thinking? Um, well, we're cross linking. Traditionally, we've been cross linking people uh, who are older than sixteen. But the cutoff limit age group for cross linking has uh, actually come down. So, with pediatric cross linking, if we find that you have progressive keratoconus, uh, it's definitely worthwhile cross linking at a young age, and typically. When keratoconus is progressive when you're young, it rapidly progresses. So it's, ver it's very important to monitor uh, pediatric keratoconus uh, carefully. And cross-linking should be done if there is evidence of progression. Okay, now we've got some more uh, philosophical questions as, as the, uh, <laughs> that are coming now. So we'll see how we go with these. So firstly from Sean, what efforts are being made through Medicare or private health to help relieve the financial costs of keratoconus? Who wants to start with that one? Elsie, you've just published a paper on this. Um, I, that was uh, Shrujana looking at the economic costs. So I'll let Shrujana answer that one. Um, in terms of the um, cross-linking, as you know, a few um, about two years ago, cross-linking became available on the Medicare benefit schedule. And so that's obviously helped a lot of people access uh, cross-linking around Australia because prior to that, there were only two places um, in Australia here and in Sydney who routinely offered cross-linking through their public system, I think. Um, if there's anyone from interstate, um, I, I can be corrected there if I got that wrong. Um, so so that having cross-linking now on the uh, with an MBS on the MBS schedule, it's allowed access a lot more. Um, in terms of things like uh, the cost of contact lenses um, and the cost of spectacles, which obviously need uh, replacing much more frequently than the average person, um, I don't think there's been any push at the moment to have any of that subsidised any more than it already is. Shri, did you want to make a comment? Yep. Yep. Uh, as I mentioned in my uh, talk, the economic uh, impact study is actually the first study that we ever undertook in Australia, or for that matter, uh, globally as well, which has collected the actual data uh, uh, related to the uh, out-of-pocket costs uh, of the direct and indirect costs associated with the diagnosis and management of keratoconus. So such studies would help the government and the policymakers understand what the keratoconus patients are having to pay for their contact lenses and for the spectacles. So out of that report, out of that project itself, uh, Professor Mark has actually uh, used those results to uh, put forward the uh, um, request for cross-linking to be uh, subsidized in the MBS scheme. So our research comes into picture in uh, putting forward those useful results. So obviously, as Elsie mentioned, it is the next step that we need to do in conducting such important result, uh, research, wherein we can show that it is an economic impact to the patients as well as the family members and overall to the economy. And we need to do something else so that the costs of the spectacles and contact lenses and the contact lens care are also further covered. So we are trying to do something else about it as well, based on the research that we are conducting. Good. Now, there's a couple of questions here that are more uh, sort of practical uh, problems, I suppose, as people get older. So uh, from Susan, what is the probability that there will be a solution for aged people that does not entail rigid lenses in the future. Elaine, do you want to um, think about that one? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question again? <laughs> Apologies. So there's a, it's a question about um, as people get older, um, they can't wear contact lenses or you know, they, uh, they find contact lens tolerance drops or they them in and out. Um, is there some solution for people with keratoconus as they get older? other than contact lenses? Ah, uh, yes. So 
fortunately or unfortunately, as you get older, you develop cataracts. <laughs> so which are the lenses that are behind? So if the cornea is here, the lenses are behind it. And when cataracts develop, it will affect your vision. And what we can do nowadays is that um, if your keratoconus, the front part of the eye has been stable and has been recorded to be stable, we can actually put in a, take out the cataract and put in a toric lens, which actually corrects for the astigmatism. It probably doesn't fully correct um, uh, the vision completely. You'll still rely on glasses a little bit, but it will significantly reduce the amount of um, glasses requirement and the contact lens that's required um, that you normally would have. So I guess, you know, having cataracts can be a blessing in disguise. There's also other things that we can do if you didn't have a cataract, which is like um, a pinhole lens that we can insert in between. But at this stage, you know, we generally try not to move to that because if you insert a lens between that, the chances of getting cataract is a bit higher. So I would say just stick to the cataract surgery when cataracts develop and when you, uh, after the cataract surgery, your vision will be much improved even without your contact lens. Okay, and on a similar theme from uh, Erica, um, what does the future look like for those of us who've had transplants and now have progression and are contact lens intolerant? Elsie, do you want to try, try that one? So, so is that implying that there's distortion of the... So that's someone who's had a transplant where it becomes uh, distorted again with time? Well, or, or they can't wear a contact lens. They've got, maybe they've got some astigmatism or some uh, irregularity, but as they get older, they wear a contact lens over their transplant. Um, so it's a similar sort of thing that Elaine was mentioning um, in the sense that the similar sort of issues arise after a corneal transplant as they do with keratoconus itself. So you have distortions of the transplant in some situations and in others, after 10, 20 years of a transplant for keratoconus, you start to get distortion of the transplant just as you do in keratoconus. So in a very similar way, just as Elaine mentioned, that depending on the amount of distortion or uh, astigmatism that we call it, you can have cataract surgery and we can potentially address it um, through cataract surgery. Um, because presumably um, for many of these people, because um, you're getting older, you're already developing a cataract. Um, but that again does assume that the astigmatism or the irregularity is stable and it's not constantly changing, which it can do for some people. So I think some of these questions are really uh, complex for, um, for patients. And I think it's, uh, it's great that we've got a whole lot of people who are dedicated to looking after the interaction between uh, the cornea and cataracts and, um, and trying to find the best solution for the patients. There's one more question here from Ashley. Um, if I make a donation to the Centre of Eye Research, how can I make sure my donation is specifically directed to keratoconus research? Um, Sujana, have you got uh, an answer yeah. to that one? Hi, Ashley. Thanks for the question and thanks indeed for thinking to donate to keratoconus research. Uh, it's an incredible thing uh, that we researchers get some support in terms of the donation. Now, uh, how to make the donation? If you go on to the SERA website, uh, to the donation uh, uh, link, uh, and click on the uh, tab that says the projects that uh, you can donate to, you'll find the keratoconus research. Please select that button. And when you select it and make any donation, uh, the amount that you donate comes directly to our keratoconus projects. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thanks, Shoshana. I think that's, uh, that's it for questions for today. And really, it's been a, a fantastic event. Some of the questions have really tested out um, some of our panelists, and they're the sort of things that we really puzzle about every day. So um, can, I, can you join me in a virtual uh, round of applause for um, Elaine Chong, Shoshana, Professor Paul Baird, Professor Vishal Janji, and Dr. Elsie Chen, and thank them for their um, contributions today. Um, I think that was a, a resounding <laughs> round of applause. So at the conclusion of today's event, we'll be sending an email with a link to the recording so you can watch it again. If you've got other questions, I'm sure you can send them in to us and we'll do our best to answer them. But I think with all these things, it's always best to go and. Uh, talk to your doctor and uh, ask him the questions. You can usually um, get, get the answer you want by doing that. Um, I hope you're looking after yourself and each other during this, uh, this terrible uh, pandemic. 
And um, please, that, please know that uh, we're thinking of you and um, are continuing our work despite all the restrictions of not being able to get into the labs and so on. I hope we'll have a, uh, a real event um, and we can meet you all um, this time next year. And just a reminder, if you'd like to join us on our mission to better help understand um, keratoconus and find new treatments, uh, you can support our work at, um, at, at the website. So um, thank you all again for your attention. We've just come up to the hour, so I'll wish you all well and see you next year. <laughs>